Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Hannah Luden, CDS Director, and I'm very happy to have you here with us for the, our lecture of today. I'm very happy to introduce you and to welcome Mr. Meir Javed Anfar from Israel. He is an Iranian Israeli and a Middle East analyst. He will talk to us today about uh, Iran and the relations with Israel. And um, before I give him the floor, I would like to introduce him to you shortly. Mayer teaches the course Iranian Diplomatic and Security Studies uh, as in the master program uh, for students who study counterterrorism at, uh, in Herzliya at the Interdisciplinary Center, uh, which is one of the universities of Israel. He's also a senior research fellow at the Meir Ezri Center for Iran and Persian Gulf uh, at the University of Haifa. He, uh, is, he has co-authored uh, the first biography ever written about the Iranian president. The, uh, the book was, trans was translated into English, Hebrew, Polish, and Dutch. And the Dutch title is Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud um, uh, Ahmad, I'm sorry, I can't pro uh, pronounce this name very good. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the nuclear sphinx from Tehran. Um, currently, Mayor is working on his PhD thesis which uh, discusses Iran's uh, perception of threat in relation to Iraq and the Soviet Union in the period of the Shah, which is the, uh, the years 1941 to 1979, just, just uh, up to the uh, Iranian revolution. I'm very pleased to have you here. We will work uh, as followed. Mayor will give a lecture of about half an hour, uh, and after which we have time for questions and answers. If you have any questions, you can use the button, which says Q and O A uh, on the bottom of uh, on the bottom of the screen, and you can uh, uh, write your questions. Please formulate them shortly in order for me to be able and to to read them and to select the the ones on a proper for order and to uh, be able to ask them to mail. Uh, questions again, Q and A on the bottom of the screen. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Good, uh, good evening from Tel Aviv. Um, hello, Amsterdam, or hello, Holland. This is Tel Aviv calling. Uh, it's very nice to be with you all. Um, it would be nicer to be in person, to meet you all in person, but you know, we are living in the COVID age, so uh, this will have to do for now. Um, what I will do is for the next 25 minutes um, or less, if I can. Uh, I will talk about, uh, I'll give my presentation, you have it on the screen, I'll be using my, uh, my presentation here to go through um, what I want to talk about and then afterwards uh, we can have a conversation and, and I really look forward to it. So, you know, this evening I'm here to talk about Iran and Israel. Um, I, I assume, I think it's a safe assumption to make that you know Israel pretty well, you know about the topography of Israel, you know about the country of Israel. But um, I'm not sure how many of us, how many of you know about Iran. And to be honest with you, um, uh, unfortunately, not many people can go to Iran. So I can understand what, what we see about the country. A lot of it is on the news. And um, as we know, uh, the news, they don't have that much time to go into depth. Um, if we really want to understand Iran-Israel relations, uh, I think it's first and foremost, it's very important to understand the country of Iran. And what's the best way uh, to, to, to understand the country, uh, about its character, about its, uh, its, about its people. Um, it's actually to look at the map. You know, that's why they call it geostrategic or geopolitical, geography. Um, geography makes politics, basically. And um, uh, if you really, you know, um, for example, countries that are landlocked, countries that don't have access to the sea, countries that are usually mountainous, uh, they are believed to be more, more um, more conservative in their thinking because countries that are more cut off, um, ideas don't flow easily and also it's dif difficult for resources. It's their resource poor. So that means that uh, many people in, many, in, in such circumstances, they opt for stability rather than democracy if, they, if, they, if the choice is only between the two of them. Um, there are numerous very good, good books have been written about this topic. One of them is by Fred Kaplan, um, uh, called Revenge of Geography. There's another book called Prisoners of Geography. 
Uh, and I really recommend those books. Um, they're good for understanding any country. Looking at a map and topography of the country is good for understanding any country. And you know, when I talk about landlocked countries uh, being usually conservative countries that are usually flat and, and they have access to sea routes, especially trade routes, they're usually liberal. And I cannot think of a better example than your country, Holland. Um, you know, if you compare Holland, uh, you know, uh, Rotterdam, your main ports, Amsterdam, um, country, Holland being a relatively um, uh, liberal country, a very liberal country, or, port or, or, or places such as New York and Los Angeles in America which are ports where there's lots of trade, lots of ideas, lots of traffic compared to countries that, you know, areas in the United States, such as the Appalachian Mountains, uh, which are more conservative because they're more landlocked or, or areas such as Kurdistan, countries such as Kurdistan or Afghanistan, which are very mountainous and very land, uh, and landlocked. So what about Iran? Um, if you look at the map, a topographical, out, a topographical look at Iran, look at the see, see majority of the country is actually very mountainous. Um, generally, about 90% of Iran is not fit for, for agriculture because it's uh, mainly mountainous and desert, as you can see in the, in the middle of the screen. You have the two major um, uh, mountains, mountain range, the Alborz and the Zagros. Uh, and behind that, you have the Kavir Desert and the Lut Desert. And the reason why in the middle you see those deserts is because the mountains basically stop the, the clouds uh, from going into the country. I'll talk about the precipitation rates in the next slide. But generally, Iran has usually, had, it's, it's been, a, you know, everybody think about, thinks about Iran oil, yes, but in terms of, you know, um, in terms of other natural resources, you need more than oil to survive agriculture, especially. And oil was, remember, oil was only discovered in 1907 in Iran. Before that, Iran was actually a very poor country. Um, and one of the reasons it, it was uh, unstable for many years, especially from the 16th century onwards, uh, was because it was a resource poor country, because agriculture is, be, it is very difficult in terms of having pasture lands for raising cattle for, uh, and for agriculture. And of course, one of the other, um, before I go to the next slide also, you have to remember that it makes, difficult to set, it, makes it difficult to ship goods across Iran because also it's a, it's a mountainous country and it's hostile environment. Uh, it's, not, it's not a flat country in any shape or form. So again, so that, that meant that major cities, many of them were cut off and trade was usually restricted uh, um, between, uh, within provinces or sometimes just enough food or products were grown for consumption in that country, in, in, in the city. That's before the roads were developed and, and Iran had its um, transportation sector developed uh, from the time of Reza Shah, who came to power around 1925. Another major, so another major um, challenge faced by Iran and Iranians is the lack of water, precipitation rates. Um, let me just look at the, you know, the World Bank figures. These are from 2014. I'm actually surprised the World Bank, you would think they would have more up-to-date figures. It's something like six years out of date, but I don't think they're too act too too uh, too far. Uh, you know, they are pretty similar to the to the numbers that we see today. The precipitation rates in Iran: 228 uh, millimeter of rain per year. Let's compare that to Israel. In Israel, it's 435. Iran, the average rainfall is less than Israel, and we know you've been to Israel, many of you. You know, this is a dry country, and Iran is drier. Um, something like 200 milliliters less rainfall um, than, than, than Israel. What about Holland? The figure for Holland is 778 milliliters. So, you know, Iran gets about a third of the rainfall that you get in Holland. I'm sure there are many people in Holland who say, well, that's not actually a bad thing. I understand. I lived in England. I know what rainy days, too many rainy, day, rainy days can be like. But, you know, this really impacts the issue of, um, this, this makes living in Iran, especially agriculture in Iran, very difficult with most of the agriculture in the country taking part, taking in the, in the north of the country on the, on the shores of the, uh, of the Caspian Sea. And of course, you should, that's not too surprising to understand that that's mainly, that's the areas that have been more liberal in terms of political thinking in Iran uh, because they're more, they're less hostile to live. Actually, those areas where the, the Iranian uh, two-day party, the Iranian Communist Party, uh, was very strong, uh, and they even had a re republic, the, the Jangalid movement, between 1920 and 1921. 
But generally, because of the topography of Iran, also Iranians are generally conservative. Um, it's, it's, Iran is a conservative country, not conservative like the Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but generally it's a conservative country where religion has played an important role. Uh, of course, the Iranian regime has taken things to the extreme and people are becoming more sick of religion today. That's something I can talk about later on. But generally, the Iranians are, are conservative. I can talk about my own family, Iranian Jews. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Iranians are gen generally conservative in their, in their uh, outlook and thinking. There has been a shift over the years, of course, because of the way the Iranian regime has forced religion upon the, upon the people of Iran, which has created a backlash. And also because people are more open to ideas thanks to, uh, thanks to the internet, thanks to applications such as Telegram, which you know there are 80 million Iranians, there are 40 million Telegram users in Iran. And also because the Iranian television is so abhorrent that many people watch uh, satellite TV stations from abroad. Uh, you know, recently a television director in Iran said that the only people who watch Iranian TV are people in prison or in hospital, because those people basically can't change the channel. So, you know, because many more people are watching Persian language uh, broadcasts, uh, BBC Persian and others abroad, people are more exposed to other ideas. But generally, again, I'll go back to say Iran is a, is a conservative country and it's, um, Iranians are generally conservative. So it's a very, Iran is a very dry country. So that makes it even more difficult for issues such as regarding finding water and, and agriculture. And of course, one of the bigger, um, and, I, and it really saddens me to say this, is that Iran is going right now through one of its uh, biggest droughts in its recent history. Um, there are, um, this is creating um, migration from the periphery of the country, from around the border areas, more inside where there's more water. It's creating political instability uh, in the country. There have been demonstrations in a number of places because of the, because of the lack of uh, water, especially in Iran's Khuzestan province. We, we saw recently there were clashes. Um, so this makes, again, this makes it even more difficult to Iran, the lack of water. And I'd say the drought, which has been continued, which has started about four years ago, this is a serious threat to, to Iran's, uh, top, not, not just topography, but also its population. Um, which is finding it, especially as I said, in the periphery area, they're finding it more difficult to find water. So for example, if you look at the map of Iran on the borders of Pakistan, you, you find people that are moving from that part of Iran more towards the north in cities such as Mashhad. Uh, and that's creating um, kind of pressure that, you know, uh, there's too many people chasing too, too, too few water. And also another problem is that we have, unfortunately, the problem of sinkholes in Iran appearing in Tehran, according to Iranian press, every month there's at least one sinkhole that's appearing. We all know what a sinkhole is, but in case you don't know, let me just... This is a sinkhole. This one's not in Iran, but just to give you a picture of what a sinkhole is like. Every, um, unfortunately, um, this is a problem uh, that the... Um, the um, Lack of water is a, is a problem that is uh, impacting. Can I, uh, Hannah, can you see the slides? Yes, we can, but I would like to ask you to, to, to make a slide presentation so the slides become bigger. Sure, sure, sure. sure. You know, I think it's going to be easier for us to see. Of course, of course. Um, how do I go to, hang on one second. Uh, this is PowerPoint, isn't it? It's, so you uh, it's the Gmail answer to PowerPoint. Oh, I see. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is already clearer than it was. I'm not sure how it works and I can't see it very well, the small letters. Uh, I guess it will be... Uh, Here we go. You, yes. Here we go. That's it. That's much better. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you for telling me. Um, so on top of the, the problems of uh, lack of water, um, um, which is, you know, the lack of water is something that we're all facing. It's a challenge that we all in the Middle East are facing. Also in Iraq, they're facing it. Um, uh, in Iran, there was some effort to, to try to tackle this before the sanctions were imposed by President Trump. Um, there was some movement in this, but um, again, I haven't heard a lot. They were getting some German company to help with the management of water. 
but Iran really needs desalination plants and, and unfortunately we, it, there's not enough movement. So, you know, um, we're worried about what will happen in the near future in, in Iran because uh, water shortages can also hit major cities. Tehran for the last two years has been sometimes on the borderline in terms of the water that's available around on the, in, the, in the dams surrounding Tehran. So this is a major problem that Iran is facing and whatever, whoever, whichever regime is in power will, will have to uh, will have to deal with in the in the future. Another problem um, insecurity that Iran uh, has uh, it's basically sitting on uh, environmental insecurity. Iran is sitting on two earthquake fault lines, not one but two, as you can see from the map over there. Um, we are in Israel are also sitting on a on a on an earthquake fault line, but this, because this is a smaller country, um, so far uh, there have not been thankfully no 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 not any major earthquakes. But in Iran there have been a number of earthquakes. The last major one was in the city of Bam in 2003, more than 15,000 people killed. Uh, there, there was another one in northwestern Iran in the, in the early 90s that killed, uh, I think it was around uh, Rasht, if I'm not mistaken, or, or the Azerbaijan province. I can't exactly remember, but it was in Iran's northwest. And it was, I think that killed also another 20,000 people. There have been a number of other uh, major um, uh, earthquakes in Iran, and this is a this is a major problem for Iran. People are there. There was one earthquake in Tehran three weeks ago, of, uh, on four on the Richter scale, and people got very nervous, and understandably so. Um, not just the Iranians abroad, the Iranian Iranians at home, but the Iranians abroad, like myself. Uh, people are very very worried because Tehran is sitting on an earthquake fault line, and and the building standards unfortunately were not improved. Rafsanjani in the early 90s, former President Rafsanjani asked and instructed the new building codes, uh, buildings to, to uh, basically follow codes to make uh, buildings more, res more um, earthquake resistant. But unfortunately, they, they ha it seems that they have been ignored. Um, I'll give you a quick COVID update, uh, which is also very interesting. This is something that we are all, uh, this is a challenge that we are all facing around the world, but in Iran especially. Um, in Iran, so far, according to official figures, there are more than 164,000 confirmed cases and more than 8,000 dead. These are official figures. Um, but, but one thing we have to know that in Iran, uh, there's a strong censorship regarding the num numbers of, uh, of, those, uh, of the infections. The Revolutionary Guard Intelligence is monitoring the social media and it's monitoring uh, uh, you know, Facebook and other, you know, all the social medias to make sure, and also the press, to make sure that nobody gives a, a figure that is different to, to the official figures. And unfortunately, again, uh, we can guess that the numbers are much higher than this. It could be twice as much uh, the number of dead in Iran and infected, or even three times as much. Some of the newspapers, some of the foreign press, um, uh, foreign-based Iranian um, outlets, such as BBC Persian and others, have been you have in the past called uh, hospitals in Iran to get numbers, and they found that uh, that the numbers being presented by the government is is uh, maybe half or even less than than the real number. So this is this is a real disaster that the Iranian regime is uh, mishandling. I have to say, um, COVID nineteen was uh, was discovered in Iran prior to the February February twenty one February twenty first. Um, uh, parliamentary elections, but unfortunately the regime hid it from the people um, because they didn't, they were worried that you know if there's news of COVID, people will not uh, go to um, go to vote. So basically, you know, they played with people's lives, and this is something that has really hurt the legitimacy of the regime greatly. And afterwards, when the city of Komi, central Iran, which was uh, which was uh, basically the epicenter of COVID-19. It was not quarantined and people were traveling in and out of that city and there were a number of calls for, for the city to be quarantined and unfortunately this regime didn't quarantine the city. So, um, you know, to, if, if we just think that the numbers are twice as much as uh, the official figures in Iran, there are today at least 16,000 dead people from, from COVID-19 and this is really uh, making people worried. And on the other hand, you know, the government has tried to, uh, to create social distancing and has tried to say, to tell people not to go to work. Many of the civil servants were told to, to stay at home. They're slowly going back to work. But I also have to say that people have also not been listening. So it's, it's a two-way street. 
Yes, the regime has terribly mishandled this situation. The regime is first and foremost responsible. But because there's such lack of faith and credibility regarding anything that the regime says, so when it says something right, that people should stay at home, people should keep social distancing, people don't listen. And they're, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, people were going on during the Nauru celebrations, they were traveling in and out of Tehran, visiting family. Sometimes you get pictures of Tehran parks at 12 o'clock at night and it looks like daylight, there's so many people out there. But Iranians are very sociable people, I can understand that. But uh, unfortunately, in this case, people were not following, have not been following the government instructions. Um, they, and just to give you an economic update also, the, Iran is unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for the people facing a severe um, a economic, uh, severe economic situation right now. Um, uh, first there was the sanctions which really hurt Iran's economy and now we have the problem of COVID-19 which have also um, uh, hurt Iran's economy. It's estimated that COVID-19 will cost the Iranian economy somewhere between 20 to 30 billion dollars. And according to Saeed Leilaz, who is a respected Iranian um, economic expert in, in Iran itself, uh, if we think about it, this year's budget, um, according to the, not the official rate, but the non-official, the real rate of the Toman versus uh, dollar, this year's budget comes to something like $36 billion. So just think $30 billion damage being, the dollars damage being caused by COVID-19. This is something that is a, that is a very, very um, major, major challenge for the, that's a big challenge for the Iranian regime to handle. Um, inflation was dipping prior to the sanctions, but as soon as the sanctions were imposed again, the, the regime started printing money because it wasn't getting any investment from abroad. So we have a situation where the inflation is running um, at, I think, 33 to 34%, and it's expected to get to 40% 40, uh, 40 this year. And the budget deficit this year is expected to be anywhere between 25% to 45%. So Iran is going through one of its toughest economic years in recent memory. First and foremost, it's a combination of sanctions and, and major mismanagement and very, very bad corruption uh, by the regime. Now, let's talk about issues that relate to Israel, Iran and Syria. Um, the Iranian regime is, um, it continues, as far as we know, they, they are continuing to support the Assad regime. Um, there was recently a report um, that came out from Israel that said that uh, um, Iran is withdrawing its forces from Syria. Well, there is the there's the general belief in Israel that that report was produced by um, let's just say massage by um, Defense Minister Naftali Bennett, who was just about to leave the Defense Ministry and he wanted to leave on a high note. So uh, he came up with this theory that Iran is removing its soldiers and this is why we're not seeing attacks. But there have been other uh, contradictory beliefs and I believe and I, I side with them more that Iran has, is probably not uh, withdrawing its forces, but what they're doing is right now they are lo laying low in, uh, in, in Syria. Um, they are not launching too many attacks. It could be for a number of reasons. It could be because of the COVID-19 challenges in Iran, but more importantly, I think it's more because of the challenges with which the Assad regime is facing. And we have to remember Assad is also uh, dealing with Corona and of course with a, ter with a terrible civil war, but more importantly with sanctions. And uh, Assad wants to attract investment from abroad, and so does uh, so does Putin. So, um, and it seems that for now, they it seems that uh, they are trying to get Iran to stop its attacks or, or to stop its uh, transfer of weapons at least um, uh, to Hezbollah and for bringing weapons into into Syria. It seems that they, they, those the traffic has lessened, and based on that, we see there's not that many. Um, uh, Israeli strikes recently, reported Israeli strikes. But in terms of Iranian fighters or pro or Iranian militia leaving, the general belief is that no, that's not the case. Uh, in terms of how much it has cost Iran to, um, to support Bashar al-Assad, recently a former member of the Iranian Parliamentary Commission for Foreign Affairs and Security, um, Felahat Pichet, he said that, it, that supporting Assad has cost Iran somewhere between 20 to 30 billion dollars. This is the first official ever, I think, number that we've heard from Iran in terms of how much it has uh, supported Bashar al-Assad. Is it accurate? I would have to say that probably the real number is 
probably more. How much more? It's a, uh, at a pure guess, I would say maybe, maybe uh, it's more like the, in the range of uh, $40 billion, but that's just a, you know, out of the air estimate because the Iranian usually down, regime downplays these numbers because it, we know that the reaction would be very strong if the number was higher in Iran, uh, uh, because you know, Iran's got its own challenges in Iran and people would say, hang on a minute, why, why are you spent $40 billion supporting this butcher, Mr. Bashar al-Assad who gasses his own people when we in Iran need our own, um, um, uh, uh, we need these resources at home. This is just a theory. Uh, but I, I know as a matter of fact that the majority of the people of Iran don't support Iranian regime, support for Bashar al-Assad, not only because they, uh, they uh, want the money at home and rightly so, uh, but also because Bashar al-Assad is, is despicable what he's done to his own people. And of course, the use of chemical weapons against his own people, let's not forget the people of Iran were victims of chemical attacks by Saddam Hussein and now for the Iranian regime to, to finance a regime that's using chemical attacks against its own people, that's pretty reprehensible. And how do we know that the people of Iran are against this? Have I done a survey? No, no I haven't done a survey, but the tool that we have, that we know that that's a pretty good indication is that in Iran, nobody's allowed to talk about whether Iran should continue to support Bashar al-Assad or not. There's no debate on it. There is no debate. The, ter the former Tehran mayor, Karabas Chi, just mentioned in, um, in 2017 that we should be helping Assad otherwise and not with weapons and he got a one-year sentence to go to prison. The reason why the regime bans any discussion regarding this issue is because it knows it's in the extreme minority. Um, why the regime supports Bashar al-Assad? First and foremost because he provides um, through Syria they can uh, supply Hezbollah and also because Bashar al-Assad is seen as a long-term ally of Iran. He's provided Iran with a base in Syria, presence in Iran in Syria, and also Iran has got a lot of economic investments. So if Bashar al-Assad falls, not only they would lose an access point to, to, to Hezbollah, but Iran would also use an economic, an economic investment destination, also a very important ally who supported Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. Iran and Iraq, now that's, an, if, that's a fascinating story. Um, throughout, you know, Iran and Iraq, what happens in Iraq, impacts Iran. This is a country that is very, very important to Iran's security. And I'm not talking about just uh, the, after the um, uh, Islamic Revolution. Prior to the Islamic Revolution, Iraq has had great influence, probably the, one of the countries that has had the most influence, foreign countries that has had the most influence on Iran um, is actually in Iraq. So much so, for example, uh, that in 1823, the British set up a consulate in the city of Karbala, 1823, in order to influence events in Iran. Why? Because a lot of clergy were going to Karbala in Iraq to, uh, to study, and from there they wanted to start using them to lobby for their own policy. There are a number of reasons, the, the historic connections between the two countries, um, and also Iraq has been a, was a, is, a, is a center of Shiism, which is the main religion in Iran, uh, so, you know, uh, so there's very, very strong connection. There's a, there's a lot of families in Iraq who've got, um, in, in the Shia part especially, or there were until Saddam expelled them with, with Iranian background. So, and of course, afterwards we saw, uh, you know, the Soviets trying to get to, inf to have influence on Iraq and the Shah tried to overthrow the Iraqi regime. This is the Shah, I'm not talking about Khomeini even. The Shah was financing groups who wanted to overthrow the Ba'athist regime, which was Saddam Hussein, in the 70s. Never mind what happened after the revolution. So Iraq is a very, very important country. So what happens in Iraq can threaten Iran's security. And of course, this is why Iran in history has needed to be strong. It's true. The Iranian regime does a terrible job of justifying why Iran needs to be strong. Um, the way the Iranian regime continues, everybody wants Iran weak. But in reality, if you look at the map of Iran, if you look at the countries around it, um, Iran has needed to be strong. And one of the reasons has been Iraq, actually. One of the reasons why the Shah built a very strong army is because he wanted to make sure that Iraq doesn't uh, threaten Iran's stability. And guess what happened? The Shah fell. Iran became weak because it cut its relations were cut off with, with the United States for the stupid decision of invading the U.S. Embassy. And what happened? Saddam used the opportunity and invaded Iran. So again, Iraq is a very important country. Iran, the Khomeini tried for regime change in Iraq between 1980 and 1988. He couldn't get it. Inadvertently, the Americans handed him that, 
that present basically and the regime that present by overthrowing Saddam Hussein. Now, since then, the Iranians have been trying to influence um, uh, Iraqi politics. They've been very successful through the Shia allies. Um, and, and, but now I have to say there's a new prime minister in Iraq, Prime Minister Kazemi, which seems to want to at least distance himself from the Iranians. He wants to be equidistant between the Iranians and the Americans. Whereas uh, other Iraqi prime ministers, such as Nuri al-Maliki, he, uh, he was too close to the Iranians as far as uh, many Iraqis were concerned. Iran has a lot of influence in Iraq without a shadow of a doubt. But the new uh, prime minister is trying to adjust that. And I have to say Iran is losing its luster in Iraq because it's very interesting. Iraq, a country that sectarian politics played such an important part in, and uh, now we see demonstrations where people are basically, it's a very progressive movement of, movement of young Iraqis who say, we want our country to be run by, tech, by capable technocrats. We don't care if they are Sunni or if they are Shia or if they are a Christian. Um, it's, they want capable technocrats and that's understandable when you live in a country that is so rich in oil resources. And I've been told by friends in Europe who visited Basra, they say you can't walk the streets for the rubbish. You know, they're so incapable, they can't, in terms of providing um, uh, services to their cities and education and, and trash collection and things like that, and electricity that people want change and they want to move away from this sectarian politics. There's a growing, growing tendency in Iraq, and, and this is bad news for the Iranian regime. And, and Kazemi, the, Iraq, the new Iraqi prime minister, was actually a compromise choice for the Iranians. So that doesn't mean they don't have any influence in Iran, Iraq. They do. But Iraq is moving in directions towards, you know, people are, as I said, moving more and more towards non-sectarianism, which is not good news for Iran. Iran and Lebanon, um, a very important, uh, uh, especially for us in Israel, a very important issue, relations continue. But I have to say that Euro Lebanon is facing a major uh, economic crisis uh, right now. They've had to borrow money from the IMF. Um, and this is something that is, uh, that's something that Hezbollah didn't want. Um, but, you know, the economic situation makes it, makes his, I think, makes Hezbollah less risk averse in terms of when it comes to Israel. They still have their missiles. They still have somewhere between 100 to 150,000 missiles. But because of the economic situation in, in Lebanon, it's, it's, it's very important. You know, Nasrallah does get his money from Iran. At least 75% of his money comes from Iran. But he's also a, a Lebanese politician for whatever we think of him. Um, uh, so he also has to play the domestic game. So, you know, I think it makes him for now more, um, more risk, sorry, more risk averse in terms of wanting to, uh, to start a conflict with Israel. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'll, I'll expand on any points that uh, you have, if you have any questions, uh, or if you want me to go through anything that I talked about. Uh, you also have my uh, Twitter, uh, at the bottom here, if you want to write it down, at Mayor J.A., um, I'll be happy also to, to, to discuss things further on Twitter. And I'll hand it back to Hannah. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yes, Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, maybe, maybe you could elaborate a little bit. If, if I understood well, the number of uh, 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 versions in Iran is about 51% of the population. Could you elaborate a little bit about the demographics of Iran and maybe also about the small Jewish community in Iran? Sure. Um, Iran is about, yes, about 55% Persian, about 20 to 25% Azeri, uh, and the rest are Kurds, which is like 10% of the country, and Arabs, 10% of the country. Um, the Jewish community um, is about 8,000 approximately. Um, when I left Iran, um, when my family, we left Iran in 1987, we went to the UK and uh, from there I, I moved to Israel. In, 19, in 1987, it was about 25,000. Overwhelming majority of Iranian Jews have left. Why? Um, majority of them left soon after the revolution. It's believed that prior to the re revolution, there were 75,000 to 100,000 Iranian Jews. But majority left because as soon as the revolution happened, the regime started, it hung a very prominent Jew, Ab Habib al -Ghanayan. And um, he wasn't the only one. There were two other, two other Jews who were also killed by the regime. And that created panic. And then 16 days after the revolution, the first uh, visitor to Iran 
Oh God, that was a scary day. I remember my parents. Um, was Mr. Yasser Arafat. Imagine there were halal flights before to Tehran and now you have Mr. Yasser Arafat. Uh, Mr. Yasser Arafat arriving to Tehran, in Tehran and taking over the Israeli embassy. And then afterwards there was the war and then they stopped allowing Jews to go to school on the Shabbat, which is why we left in around 1987. They told the Jews, right, all minorities, Christians have to go to school on, the, on Sunday, Jews have to go to school on the, on the Shabbat. Um, but everybody, just like old students, they can have Fridays off. Um, so this is why we left. And after that, actually, life has become easier for Iranian Jews. So after that, uh, there have been reported visits to Israel um, from, uh, from by Iranian Jews via Turkey. Um, and we, we were calling each, you know, uh, our families. My, the Brit Mila of my youngest son, Daniel, was broadcast live to Tehran. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on one of the apps that they use called IMO. Um, so we're very close in touch with relatives and friends, but recently a law has been passed that says that Iranians can no longer be in uh, touch with Israelis. I mean, if you happen by accident and talk to an Israeli, that's fine, but you can't be in touch uh, with, like premeditated or prearranged contact. So now there's a law against it. Um, does that mean that people are going to stop uh, calling Israel, the Jewish family? Because it is going to make life hard for them. There are many Jews in Iran who have family in Israel. Many of us have family in Iran. Um, does that mean that the Iranian regime is going to break doors down and go and check every phone to see if people are called? No, I don't think they're going to do that. But uh, people are going to be fearful. And if the Iranian regime wants to make life hard for anybody, they can now use this, especially Jews, because they're going to be the big, biggest victim of this. They're going to use this as, a, as an excuse uh, if they want to uh, bang someone up in prison or if they want to get them to pay bribes. Um, this is a really unwelcome uh, um, decision by the Iranian regime. I, I'm, I'm very angry why they did this. This is just basically families who are in touch uh, from Iran. I don't, I don't know what benefit they have uh, from, uh, from stopping uh, Iranians and Israelis uh, from uh, talking to each other. I mean, God Almighty. What do they talk about? You know, you should, you should hear my mother when she speaks to our relatives and friends in Tehran. I, you know, after 15 minutes, I almost lose my sanity. It's so boring. So I don't know what the Iranian regime is actually worried about, what, what they have to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, maybe you could also elaborate in terms of uh, uh, Muslim uh, de denominations. Are most Iranians Shiite or do, is there a vast a Sunni um, uh, group? In, in Iran, and maybe another question regarding the Kurds and their uh, aspirations for an for a known uh, country or autonomy at least. How does the Iranian regime relate to that? Um, in Iran, I think um, there's about seventy percent, or sorry, seventy five percent Shia, twenty percent Sunni, roundabout, and the rest is other denominations. Um, the Kurds. Um, they have had, uh, nas they have had uh, nationalistic aspirations to have their own country. Uh, there was a Kurdish Republic of Mahabad, which uh, in a, it's, a, it's a city in, in Kurdistan that was uh, supported by the Soviet Union and, and was established by the members of the Iranian, uh, supported by the members of the Iranian Communist Party. These actually Iraqi Kurds, the Barzanis, Mullah Mustafa Barzani, they came to Iran and they set up a republic um, that lasted, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think until between 1946 and between March to December 1946, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, but after that, they have fought for their um, uh, for their uh, for independence. There have been a number of of uh, of uh, waves of uh, of uh, Kurdish aspirations. The la the major one was in 1979 after the revolution, because Khomeini. Um, promised them that there'll be more uh, autonomy for the Kurds, but when he didn't live up to it, to, to, his, to his promise, then the Kurds had an uprising in Iran and the regime sent the Revolutionary Guard and many people were killed. Now there is one organization, Pejak, in, uh, which operates from Iraqi territory. Sometimes, they haven't been very active recently, sometimes they attack regime forces, but I would have to say, after the recent failure of the referendum in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, I mean, the, the referendum for declaring state would pass, but afterwards they were under so much pressure that they couldn't, you know, I think many people in Iranian Kurdistan, I think it's safe to assume 
that you know the uh, desire for nationhood is probably lessening, but many of them want their language and culture to be maintained and for the children to learn in their language. I understand, if I'm not mistaken, that they teach Kurdish in some of the universities in Iranian Kurdistan, but I'm not sure if they teach it at the school. And do you, is there any, any notion of uh, making people convert to Shiism instead of Sunnism? Or is that not a point? In Iran, um, the problem, look, the, the minorities in Iran that suffer the worst are the Baha'is. Nice. So like being Jewish in Iran is wonderful compared to if you're being a Baha'i. I mean, in Iran, there's apartheid against the Baha'is. There's genuine apartheid. They can't go to university. And they can't hold down many jobs. They're just arrested for nothing other than on many occasions just for being Baha'i. Um, in Iran, um, they don't try to force to become Jews to become Shia. There's no, no, there's respect that, you know, they, they put okay. their, yeah, their security for the Iranian shuls. Um, no, they, but, but in Iran, unfortunately, the problem is if somebody is Muslim and they want to become, they want to turn into, they want to convert to another religion, then that's against the law. So we have a lot of cases of people who want to convert uh -huh. to Christianity. And, and the Iranian regime puts them in prison. That's, that's the problem. I mean, it's so bad that apparently the security services of Iran have put cameras outside some of the Iranian churches to see if there's anybody who's not uh, Christian going Already to those denied. churches. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some questions regarding uh, international affairs. Uh, I'll start with a simple one, and this is the relation, there is a question about how are the relations between Iran and Russia and between Iran and China? And after that, we'll move to the relation or the, with Israel. So I will, let's start with these two questions about Russia and China. Um, Iran's relations with China are, are generally good. They're very good. Um, they're very good um, in terms of China is one of the few countries that keeps trading with Iran, although the numbers have dropped recently. They buy Iranian oil. They, have, they were buying Iranian oil, but again, I think they stopped recently. But... They supported Iran, you know, they sell goods to Iran and they, they uh, but the, the, the problem is that for the, um, the problem for many Iranians is that uh, China and Russia basically have monopoly over relations with, uh, with, uh, with Iran and they would like Iran to counterbalance the pressure by the Chinese and the Russians uh, to, uh, with, with better relations with the U.S. I mean, let's just, let's just put it that, let's put it this way. Iran is uh, so much dependent on China that we have not heard one, there have not been any major condemnation in any way, shape or form of the way the Chinese have, have been treating their Uyghur Muslims. And you've read in the reports what they've been doing. I mean, we're talking about education camps. I mean, as, as Jews, for us to hear these things, it's terrible. But in Iran, they have not condemned it. And remember, the Iranian regime says that, it, that it's, uh, that it's um, supporting the people of Palestine um, uh, because they, they don't want, you know, they, they, they're dispossessed Muslims. So look, the Chinese support Iran, but not, at the, the, but not to the point where Iranian-Chinese relations pose a threat to Chinese-American relations, which also actually they are not in a good shape right now either. But China has been willing until now to support Iran to the just uh, enough so that there's enough that there's trade between them, but not more than it would cross the point where America would impose additional sanctions on on Chinese companies. So uh, this is the way the situation is right now. And also Russia relations between Iran and Russia. Look, um, there is some trade, but it's not great. They are both. Uh, cooperating on Syria. We have to remember that between 2011 and two, September 2015, the, 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 the Syrian civil war started in 2011. And until September 2015, Iran was alone in terms of supporting Bashar al-Assad. But they were losing. It's an interesting fact that, you know, the wanted, the, the, the Quds force that everybody talks about, they were losing against the Iraqi opposition, the, the Syrian opposition. And which is why uh, Rasim Soleimani, the, the, the former um, head of the Quds Force, went and asked, the, uh, asked Putin to, to come in and to bring his forces. And now the Iranians are actually, I think, um, pretty angry at the fact that the Russians are taking over the show, even though it was Iran that held the fort for four years. And now the Russians have come in and basically Putin is uh, 
has much more sway over uh, Bashar al-Assad than, than, uh, than Iran. I'm not saying Bashar al-Assad is ignoring Iran, but he, between Khamenei and Putin, Putin has a, his, his word is much more important to, uh, to Bashar al-Assad. Naturally. naturally. Sorry? And also, I said you know, naturally. What is, what is, the, what is really um, angering the Iranians, there was a report in Iran that, um, you know, for example, for Syria to give any economic contracts uh, to Iran, they would need the permission of Russia. Basically, Russia would have veto. And this is really makes the Iranians angry. And now we have Putin who's going, probably going to have more influence in Syria because there are reports that on top of the two bases that, Syria, that Russia has in Syria, they're going to get, they want to build more more bases in Syria, which means that, you know, a stronger Russia, um, for us in Israel, that's, that's actually good because uh, we want Assad to be listening more to Putin and less to Iran, to, to Khamenei, because Putin now, he just wants quiet in Syria. He wants, uh, you know, the economy to start ticking so Russian companies can invest and they can recoup their, uh, their investment in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. Yeah. So now we're coming to the relationship between Iran and Israel. What uh, there are many, many questions about that. The question is, how dangerous is Iran for, for Israel? Is it becoming worse or is, Israel, or is the, the danger uh, becoming less? And there are some questions about the relationship between Iran and the Gaza Strip and mm. uh, how it works and what should Israel do about it or how worried should Israel be? Regarding Iran and Gaza, the, the organizations that Iran has, I mean, Islamic Jihad is completely under the control of Iran. Uh, of Iran. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad is, can go as far as saying it's an Iranian puppet in Gaza. Okay? Hamas is also close to Iran, but Hamas has got more independence than, than, uh, than uh, Islamic Jihad. Um, you know, Hamas has made its own decisions sometimes that the Iranians didn't like here. For example, when they, before when they turned against Bashar al-Assad. Uh, just, if I can put it briefly, it's, Hamas is not as much in the pocket of, of Iran as, as the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is. How worried should we be? Look, we shouldn't, we shouldn't annex. We should not go ahead with the annexation because um, Mahmoud Abbas wants to have, Mahmoud Abbas is not the enemy of Israel. There are things that I have a problem with, the, the things, some of the things he does, like Palestinian education. But Mahmoud Abbas, we have very good security cooperation, and he is somebody who wants to reach an agreement with us. If we go with annexation, go, th go forward with annexation, we'll basically be humiliating and belittling Palestinian moderates uh, and inadvertently strengthening those who have always rejected peace with Israel. So this is something that, that, that really worries me. Other than and that, does I'm, Iran, excuse sorry. me, and does Iran play on this card? Iran has no influence in, in West Bank. Mahmoud Abbas does not like the Iranian regime, let me tell you. He does not like the Iranian regime because the Iranian regime has been financing his enemies. Um, but, you know, in terms of, if I can just go back to my original points, look, we should try to develop the economy of Gaza, we should definitely, and we are trying to, but I would like your viewers to know as somebody who believes in two state solution, uh, um, somebody who sees himself as an Israeli leftist, that is very, it's a very, Hamas is a very corrupt organization. It's far more corrupt than Mahmoud Abbas. And these people have ideological hatred against the state of Israel. So yeah, I don't think it's ever gonna be possible for us to reach to with Hamas. So what we can do is just make sure that the economy ticks over. But if at any time they fire at us, we have to fire twice as much. Of course, trying to avoid civilian casualties, and we, we do. Um, but we, Hamas, we have to make a very, very strong stance against Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Um, Israel and, and Iran is, first of all, Iran is not an existential threat, okay? Iran is not an existential threat to the state of Israel. But Iran is, a, the Iranian regime, I have to qualify that, is a very important threat to the security of the state of Israel. No Israeli prime minister, Netanyahu, Gantz, or even Meretz would be able to ignore the threat that the Iranian regime poses to the state of Israel because of its missiles that it's given to, to Hezbollah, because of its presence in Syria, and also because the Iranian regime, the supreme leader of Iran, is an anti-Semitic, 
Holocaust denier. Okay, he's a Holocaust denier. There's no question about it. I mean, they test ballistic missiles on the right hand and on Hebrew that Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth. You cannot ignore an enemy like that. So what should we do? We should continue to work with the international community. We should continue to strengthen our defenses. We should certainly continue to, to continue with our reported attacks in Syria to make sure that the Iranian regime doesn't dare establish a base in Syria because that's a red line for all Israelis. But also, I think now we are also involved in cyber warfare with Iran. You know, um, the Iranians attacked a water desalination, water purification plant in Israel. And had they been successful, we could have had hundreds of sick Israelis. So this is a new sphere that we are involved with, and we, we should not underestimate the Iranian regime. I have, there, there is one question, another question about uh, the, the geopolitical situation, is, and this is how dangerous is Iran for Saudi Arabia? Oh, very good question. Look, the revolution happened in 1979, and Saudi Arabia did not want to be an enemy of Iran. But Khomeini called for uprising of Shia in Saudi Arabia, and there were uprisings in, of Shia in Saudi Arabia. And that's really, this really rattled the Iranian regime. And then the Iranian regime, uh, you know, uh, started threatening Saddam Hussein, not that it justifies Saddam Hussein attacking Iran, but uh, once Saddam Hussein uh, started attacking Iran, the Saudis, after, after the first two years of the war, they started supporting Saddam Hussein because they realized that the Iranian regime really is hell-bent on trying to create instability and to, to increase, it, to, to export its fundamentalist ideas abroad. So first and foremost, I have to say, I have problems with the Saudi regime, but this is not, this is not a war that the Saudis wanted. This is not a war that the Saudis wanted. They tried on many occasions to, to improve relations with Iran. We had prime, the, the Iranian presidents, we had Khatami, we had Rafsanjani, who tried to improve relations. But in Iran, the government is subservient to the regime. And presidents, they are part of the government and they're subservient to the regime, which is headed by Khamenei. And Khamenei hasn't wanted it. Look, the Saudis have also made mistakes, but they have been, they have tried hard, they're very hard. At, at, top from by the top decision makers in Saudi Arabia to, to repair relations but the Iranian regime is not interested. We saw that they burnt down their embassy in 2016, was it in Tehran, if I'm mistaken? Uh, and there was an attack against the Saudi oil installations which is very very serious. So yes the Iranian regime is, uh, uh, is a major threat to the Saudis. Of course the, the Iranians are supporting the Houthis. Um, I, uh, you know, I condemn the killing of any innocent people in Yemen. Um, but I have to say that the Saudis also have had a genuine security concern when it comes to the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, they are very concerned if there's a Houthi government in Yemen um, because of their relations with Iran and, and Yemen borders Saudi Arabia. But I think the way the Saudis have conducted this war has actually been diabolical. I have some more questions about uh, Iran itself. One question is, is there any secularist movement within Iran and does it make any any chance at all, but there are also people concerned about the economy of Iran and they are asking themselves, are there any options for salination projects in order to uh, uh, produce more water for Iran? Is Iran capable of doing this, these things? And how do the sanctions imposed by the world work on all these kind of initiatives? Um, first and foremost, the issue of water, this is also something that's very close to my heart. Um, Look, there were some desalination plants built by Israel during the, uh, when we had good relations prior to the revolution. Actually, you know, everybody associates centrifuges with, the, with the uranium enrichment, but also the centrifuges used for water purifications. And we left some of the centrifuges in Iran, and uh, according to a report, like, I think it was like 10 or 15 years ago, at a water exhibition, um, an Iranian water specialist entered the Israeli uh, pavilion and said, look, we tried to reverse engineer your uh, purification centrifuges. We couldn't succeed. They're very good. Um, Iran, look, they need investment. Iran needs investment. I blame sanctions, but more I blame, far more I blame mismanagement in Iran. Look, Iran's had a major brain drain. People don't want to live in the country, education, educated people, because there's, you know, because of the way the regime abuses human rights, the way the regime, you know, uh, treats women, people don't want to live in that country. So we've had many, many educated Iranians leave Iran. Look, look at Holland. You've, your country has many educated Iranians. 
So, you know, and because of that, the, the, the regime has not managed this issue. And of course, if there's major investments, look, first and foremost, we need the, the, the economic, the, the, the nuclear issue to be resolved and then the new deal. I have to be honest, I put my hand up, I'm against what Trump did, but we are where we are. Um, um, and yes, the, the regime really needs to address this issue. There, I don't see a plan. I don't see an effective plan to, to address the issue of the drought. What's the other question? Uh, there was a question about secularization in Iran, and the question is, uh, is there any uh, um, attempt to, uh, of, uh, I'm not sure what this person exactly asking, is there uh, torturing in Iran, and do people really care? Do pe can people do anything about it, if I understand the question well? About torture? Uh, yes, about torture, about abuse of human rights. Right. And is there any relationship with, with this and secular groups or secularization whatsoever? Look, the Shah tortured people, but not in the same way, not in the same numbers. Okay, um, the Shah was secular. He, they were tortured by Savak, but you can't compare the number of prisoners in Iran. Of course, the population has more than doubled since then, but again, this regime has been brutal with the people of Iran. It's a very, very violent regime in terms of torture and abuse of human rights. Um, look, in, in Iran, the regime views secularization as a threat to its existence. I know people listening to this, how can it be a threat to its existence? Well, this is, this is one of the reasons why the regime, for example, is so sensitive to the issue of women's hijab, that they haunt women who don't, you know, they go after them and they, you know, they warn them and they, they try to force them, they force women to wear the hijab. It's because the Iranian regime is scared of what they see and what they call as Andalusiaization. What is Andalusiaization? You've been to Spain, you know, the southern Spain, the southern uh, provinces called Andalusia. Well, Andalusia was under Islamic law until, under Islamic rule, but, uh, uh, and then it was uh, overthrown, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 1492. The Iranian regime believes that the reason why Andalusia was overthrown by the Christians and the Islamic Empire lost that Islamic, uh, lost Andalusia was because Andalusia gradually became secular. And the more secular it became, the easier, the weaker the society became and the more easy it was for the Spanish Christian forces to, uh, to, over, to basically take over. So that's why the Iranian regime is, uh, is uh, very anti-secularization and very anti-secularism, but this is creating a backlash and more and more people are becoming secular in Iran. You visit, you ask anybody who's been recently to Iran, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, but people are really losing faith in all religion. I see, which is contrary to what is happening in other places of the Middle East, Correct. I would it's, say. It's a backlash. Look, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a problem with my Duchemesh, you know, with a water heater on, on the roof. I called someone, uh, an, an Arab compatriot, for, uh, and he came and fixed it. So when I went to pay him in his car, he was listening to a CD of Quran. Somebody was reading the Quran. And I said to him, you know what? In Iran, I don't think you would hear many people listening to, listening to the Quran in their cars. He'd say, he says, why? I said, because in Iran, religion is forced upon the people. You hear, you, I see more and more Iranians who are choosing Persian names for their children, not Muslim names. And, and the guy actually may have been a plumber, but he's a very intelligent guy. He says religion can only be taught through love. That's the only way. And unfortunately, it's not in Iran, it's coercion, not love. Well, our time is up. There are so many more questions I, could, I was not able to, to pose. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for all those people who asked so many interesting questions which we could not uh, discuss. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Mayor, for this lecture. Uh, I want to thank the public for listening and uh, posing, as I said, so many questions. This lecture will be recorded for anybody who wants to listen to it to get, or to ask somebody else to listen to it. And of course, uh, follow us because we have many more le lectures coming up. Mayor, thank you very much again. Very I much. found it fascinating, very interesting. And, uh, and not only the public, me, myself, I have so many more questions to ask. So, <laughs> so when COVID That's is over, good. invite me to Holland, I'll be there. Oh, you're more than welcome, eh, Mayor. We would thank love to have you, you around. Thank you. And uh, thank you again very much. Have a very nice evening. Have a thank very you. nice weekend. The weekend begins tomorrow in Israel already. We still have to go to work tomorrow. But, uh, and uh, thank you. Uh,
thank to the public again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Tot ziens. Later. Tot ziens. Later. Bye.